Store. Look, we've still got feedback issues. Anybody who's got. We had a good turnout. Yeah, we had a good turnout. I made issues. Colleagues, I want to make a start. Um, first of all, I have to uh, advise you all uh, that this meeting um, uh, is going to be um, webcast, uh, but not for uh, live broadcast, because unfortunately we've got some technical issues. Um, so it um, will be recorded and it will then be uploaded uh, after the meeting, at, 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 as soon as we can get it uploaded. Um, Chair, could I ask what the technical issues are? Because this is not unusual to be sat in this room to be told that um, it happens in Cabinet as well. And I was just wondering if at least we, if we got a series of one off individual issues, or is there something systemic here that needs to be addressed? I don't know the answer to the question, but I hope an officer might have the answer to the question. Amelia? This working? Yes. So the answer is that there has been an emergency this morning. And in terms of the team available to do the live streaming, it just so happens that because we don't often have lots of meetings on a Friday, there is less capacity on a Friday and the available capacity is, is with that. So, uh, unfortunately, we've had to go for, for this option. Okay. And thank you for the... I thought there was one for the chair. <laughs> thank you for the question. <laughs> thank you. Um, but let me then go on to say uh, that uh, members of the press and public who are not here, of course, uh, may record and take photographs except whether they're confidential or exempt items. Okay, that was item one. Apologies, we do have a number of apologies. Um, I've had apologies from Deirdre Olden. She's taking a, a long weekend and therefore is uh, uh, missing this meeting. Um, I hope she has it. Uh, I hope she enjoys that long weekend away. Um, apologies from Shaman Lal. He had an eye operation yesterday, long awaited eye operation, so he can't be here today either. And I'm taking it that I've got apologies from uh, Mohammed Idris. Uh, his mother died yesterday, and I'm presuming, therefore, he won't be here at the meeting today, and therefore, um, I'm giving his apologies. Any other apologies? No. Declarations of interest. Any pecuniary uh, or other interests, disposable interests, Alex? I think I need to take some uh, landlord of HMO that uh, In which case, Alex, when we get to that item, you will have to, I'm afraid, leave the room. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, we'll note that. Uh, can I move on then to the um, action points uh, arising from our meeting on the 17th of February? Uh, are there any issues that members would like to raise before we confirm them? Alex? Thank you, Chair. Um, Measures on that, so we have three action points. Um, I believe it was suggested that we should be chaired with the Chair and Chair 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 Sorry, give me that again. Scrutiny Chairs and take on DA and take it back to their individual scrutinies to see how it was relevant. To the individual scrutinies. Um, the second was on councillor training, and the third was on uh, statistics on temporary accommodation for people fleeing um, domestic abuse. Just trying to see whether we've got anything on the action tracker on any of those. There isn't. No. I was just. I didn't want those points that we made at the meeting to be lost within the minutes if they were specifically teased out as an action. Okay. <laughs> That will need, um, therefore, an update of the action tracker as well. Can I ask for clarity? Okay, thanks. That would be helpful, Alex. And we will need to update the action tracker in consequence of that. Okay, with those amendments that we'll put into uh, the notes, can we confirm then the notes of that last meeting? Okay. Uh, the action tracker, um, anyone want to pick up anything on that action tracker, albeit it will be updated following the update of the action notes? 
No. Sorry. There's one from me if I could just. Okay. Uh, yes, um, it is an action that has been previously discharged, but there has been some further information provided um, from community safety in relation to the exempt accommodation um, report. It is separate to what has been discussed today, um, and it has been asked to be uh, circulated as a, as a private and sensitive briefing to you, so we will be circulating that to you after the meeting. Okay. With that, uh... I'd like to move on on the agenda, and uh, it was a bit remiss of me, uh, but I should have introduced uh, to you all, some of you already know him, Ade Fashadi, who has recently joined the scrutiny team ahead of Gail Sadler's retirement, and he will be working primarily supporting the health and social care and joint health and social care committees, um, but they offers Ade an opportunity um, to uh, meet with all scrutiny chairs and other members, et cetera, et cetera. So, welcome. Thank you. Okay, with that, I'd like to move on to item six, which is the exempt accommodation inquiry update. And we've got uh, Guy Chondi here with us. Um, Guy, before you make um, a, a report, I, uh, there's a bit of a, um, a, a mission here in a sense, because if I look at um, the appendices that are set out in item six of the cover report. Actually, what we have not got is um, uh, EU scrutiny review recommendations March 23. It's March 22. But if I look at that, um, it says latest update March 22. That's not correct. The latest update was actually the 30th of November 2022 which was reported to coordinating ONS on the 19th of, De 9th of December, 2022. So um, I, I'm just, what I'm saying to members is that when you look at, um, therefore, the report that Guy is giving, actually what you should not be doing is comparing it with this one, which is the March, 2022 uh, update, uh, but with one which you don't have available to you on this, these, with these agenda papers, but which you received and, had noted uh, back on the 9th of December, 2022. So with that, uh, Guy, over to yourself. Yeah, and apologies for that, Chair, we make sure that we get the correct um, documents. It may be best just to circulate that to all, yeah. all the members of the committee. Uh, I have I have a copy, so don't send it to me because I've already got my copy. <laughs> Please, thank you. Uh, that's noted uh, that uh, Alex at this point uh, has formally withdrawn from the meeting when he does so. You have to leave the room, Alex. Yes. No, you have to leave the room according to what I've got in front of me. Uh, I have tried to question this in some respects, uh, Alex, because there is an aspect of this that even if you don't have a pecuniary interest, if you have a disclosable interest, it's quite clear you have to declare it. But unless you've got dispensation, you have to leave the room. Will Alex know to come back? We'll, okay. we'll get him back. <laughs> well, you can have it sometimes where I've had to have it where you leave the room because there's meant to be a secret vote taking place. And then you now, can go and stand. What, all, I, all, all I say to members is that this this is um, a, it's set out um, on your um, uh, on your uh, uh, yeah. your uh, uh, agenda. Mm -hmm. um, declarations of interest is clearly set out there. Um, it's some something over and beyond what we've ever done. And I've raised this issue because I think it is quite a that we have on non-disclosable, uh, on non-pecuniary interests. They are disclosable, yes. But if there is, a, if there are, if unless a member of the public can speak on the item and that doesn't happen, then the member with a disclosable interest has to leave the room. Guy, sorry about that, but uh, we have uh, these constraints which are now being imposed on us.
Thank you very much, Guy. I've got uh, some comments myself, and then I'll bring the members in. Um, come along the, uh, the, uh, the, the row. Um, thank you for, for, for that update, Guy. Um, RO1D uh, was about uh, inspection of 20,000 units. Um, we knew it was going to be a long haul, um, but you've acknowledged that you've now got uh, grant funding, albeit not at the level that you wanted. Um, but at least that inspection process will continue. Um, and on your inspection outcomes, uh, you noted that uh, the total now sits at 1,000. Uh, 969 at October uh, since October 2020, and presumably that's a little higher, um, given that it's gone over 2,000 now. It's gone over 2,000. So we've got a long way to go still. Um, but looking at that particular slide uh, on inspection outcomes, I did notice that um, 21 properties were decommissioned, a total of 64 since October 2020 and there were support plan reviews in place, and there were community safety investigations, et cetera, uh, un underway. What I'm trying to get to, Guy, is how I, in my own head, I get an understanding of the, the two sides of this coin. One that we're looking for exempt accommodation um, to provide that additional support to the residents of exempt accommodation, and two, uh, we're trying to avoid some of the um, uh, uh, problems that uh, arise within the community uh, uh, as a result of ex ex exempt accommodation not being perhaps properly managed. Uh, uh, so the, um, uh, the, the, some of the behaviour issues that unfortunately uh, have occurred in certain areas. I'm trying to get a feeling from for how how we've moved on on that agenda. Mm. Uh, I've got the numbers in front of me, but I don't quite get a feeling as to whether I should say that's a success or not, um, because it, I, I'm going to look at this from a perspective of a, a, a local member who's got HMOs and exempt accommodation um, in in a in a large number of uh, uh, area uh, in a in a large number in a very small area, and uh, therefore it's not statistics I'm interested in, it's actually the feeling, if you like, uh, as to what is being delivered here. I don't know whether you can help me. Yeah, I suppose there's two aspects to this, isn't there? There's, there's one which is around the level of provision and there's what, and the other issue is about the quality of the provision. Um, we, are, we identified through the strategic needs assessment piece that we've got, you know, over double what we actually define that we need in terms of supported housing provision in the city. So, the, there's, and that's what the strategy is seeking to do, is to look to try and reduce. But at the same time, we, we need to accept the fact that this is providing you know, supported housing for those that need it. So, what the, I think what the inspection, what the statistics are telling us, and if you look at things like the Cat 1 and Cat 2 hazards, so, you know, we haven't actually got the numbers, although I think we've previously provided in terms of the numbered, numbers of statutory health and safety hazards that we've identified and rectified as a result of the inspection work which potentially we wouldn't have identified, we would not have found those. And if you look at the number of support reviews, for example, you know, those are things that we wouldn't have identified without us getting behind the door and looking at it. And Pamela talked to you about the, the benefit that, that, that's that been given to the community safety team and getting police seconded in to, you know, to get underneath what some of those serious ASB and, and type issues. So I think, we, we, the stats will, will, will give you some idea of that, but if you look at it in relation to the scale of the issue, it's still, there's still a long way to go. Bring in just a moment, uh, uh, Pam. Uh, just in, in terms of um, that slide on the housing benefit process, where um, uh, a provider has refused to sign up, and your figures were eight refused and 13 agreed since March 2022, what happens when they refuse? So if, they, if they're refusing to sign to the quality standards, there's nothing we can do about it. But what it will do, if, if we get a claim from a provider that is not going through the accreditation process, whilst we can't stop the housing benefit claim, it's not a requirement in housing benefit rates, it will prompt us to go and visit them just to make sure, because the quality standards will give us that assurance that they've gone through an inspection and oversight process that's a, a good. 
we will then, if, if we get a housing benefit claim and then they're not going through that, we will go out and visit, which has then led to those eight new providers being refused. So from an inspection. Yeah. Okay. Pam? I just wanted to add on there is before this pilot started, we we're talking about six, seven years worth of providers and registered um, landlords and um, all these providers just been having free reign. No one questioning anything they were doing. So the six, years worth of problems to try and then battle in. So it's always going to be a battle about that turning point from the difference between those numbers converted into the feeling changing in the community. It's not going to be a process that's going to make that feeling happen overnight. quickly and overnight because there's, there's that, that entrenched feeling of those providers being allowed to get away with what they want to for a number of years. When we first started this um, pilot, we were actually getting landlords and providers refusing us access into their property because they could act. There is literally no legislation in place for this. But because we've built up those relationships, some in a nice way and some in not such a, a nice way, we're now over those doors. We're having regular conversations. And when you do look at the numbers and even the ones that are decommissioned, those ones that are decommissioned are the ones that were really having an impact in the community. But there's still more work to be done. It's also worth highlighting, I suppose, that in all the pilots that were done, we're the only area that um, looked at the community safety aspect of it. No other pilot area across the country looked at the community safety aspect of it. Um, and I know it's a bit of a challenge um, for colleagues like Guy and, 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 and uh, Colette when we were reviewing the money for the next two years. The government were keen not to have a community safety element again. So it's about recognising the supported accommodation element of it is absolutely vital. These vulnerable people need that support, but it's also recognising, as you quite rightly said, that wider input. And I think it's recognising from a Birmingham point of view, we are looking at it holistically where not everyone else is. And that's a real positive move forward, really. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Albert. I mean, I, th I think just picking up what you're saying there, I've got to. I think it's sort of, I don't know what it is, good counselling all around in the sense that, you know, there's some legislation that's been brought in here that you say was fundamental, was absolutely needed and gave people the wording of it and the, and the way that it was structured and the meant that basically both landlords have taken it to the absolute cleaners and basically been dumped it for everything that was in no way that anyone thought was even for. And so I, I think that you know, you've got, so you've got a piece of vital information that we as council have fed back into and hopefully sort of bringing this back now towards a more sort of regulated way that, I mean, people will always try ways to get around it, but I think this is, I'm getting a feeling now of actually starting to get somewhere where, you know, the, the tenants and the residents around them will actually start taking some positive outcomes for this. Those who need supporting will be supported and people who live nearby will hopefully start to see some sort of improvement in their communities because, you know, it has a community aspect to all this. Um, I've got sort of four sort of small sort of questions. Um, uh, the first one, R03 on page 26, uh, talks, talks about the, the Charter of Rights, and it says that 11 have been awarded out of 40 out of a total of 179. I was just wondering what happened, even of those 40 that applied, what is, if only, if I read that rightly, gold, uh, you know, gold silver, and bronze, that, that makes up 11, so there's another 29 there who didn't, didn't get anything. Uh, the other question I was going to ask was on R04 on page 27. talks about, if I read the reading between the lines uh, correctly, there's been some quite fortunate claims made that about that bit. And I'm just wondering how really important those to the police because, you know, people can make a mistake before they decide to withdraw for some of these claims. So I don't know if I was reading that correctly. Um, the other one was just to talk about job post you're advertising for. I was just wondering what sort of level of response that you had first time around or were you expecting second time around? And the final one is maybe a bit of a guide from some of the officers here. The, um, you know, good good mention of the uh, e, um, qualities implicate impact report there on the opening cover. There wasn't much mention of that in the report itself. Um, obviously when things come to cabinet, they normally actually get an impact assessment report attached to the back of it. I noticed there isn't one here, but do we get one for the scrutiny? Is it only for is it only for cabinet where we get uh, in the end for that probably is actually? Uh, and they're my questions for what I thank very much. So, yeah, uh, just on the, the Charter of Rights issue, the, the, the difference between the 40 and the 11, 11 have actually completed the assessment. 
the others have signed up, paid them, and going through the assessment. So we're hoping that ultimately they will get accredited. There have been some providers that haven't hit the standard as, as you, would, you would hope, really. Um, but I think the judge of those 40 are going through that assessment because it can be is it nine months ish yeah, to actually. You would hope that the majority of the 40 would because they obviously must feel quite confident about yeah. passing and look forward to the others to worry about. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so we're hopeful that, you know, over the next sort of few months, we'll see that number increasing. Um, in terms of fraud, so, um, yeah, so the Housing Benefits Service as part of the evidence that we provide to them, if clearly there is evidence of fraudulent claims, they refer that through the DWP, um, SPIS, the, the, the sort of national fraud agent. The one thing I will say, and I've asked the question, um, what sort of feedback we get from DWP in terms of what that leads to, and the benefit service will tell themselves they don't get any. So that's something that we've raised, and we will be raising with the DWP, that if we're referring fraudulent providers to you, we could do get some feedback, um, but we don't. Um, yeah, I think the, the recruitment has been a challenge in terms of finding the, 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 the people, and I think that we only had a, a handful of applications last time. Um, so but we've gone back out, and I think we've tweaked the advert, and um, with you know, and ultimately we'll, we'll possibly have to look at agency, or be you know, at a higher cost. Um, and the question around equalities, I don't know whether Amelia, in terms I'll, of, I'll deal with it, Guy. Yeah. Um, we don't actually get an impact assessment as cabinet get impact assessments um you will find in the cover report uh uh you and that there is um uh equality imp implica implications so there is a, sh a short paragraph there yeah, got but, and there's nothing in really yeah, i know because we don't normally have an impact assessment that comes to a uh, scrutiny committee but it's something we can look into and see whether or not that would be a valued addition um, just on a, when we did the strategic needs assessment and developed the strategy, there was quite a big section on some of the programmes. So I'll try and dig that specifically out again. Thanks, Guy. Right, I'm moving along. Roger? Okay, so a couple of areas. First of all, on the quality standards area, uh, thank you for you've, you've answered my question in terms of what was going to be about in terms of the volume that those numbers reflect. Could you also provide um, the status of, if you like, probably the top 10 providers in terms of are they engaging, are they not? Because in a way, that's the top 10 are a large proportion of the stock. So what they're, whether they're engaging or not is, um, is highly significant. So what, what they're doing. And, and then that, I'm following on from that, um, if any of those top, are, is there a risk that any of those top 10 are actually just likely to walk away when the legislation goes through? And if so, what is our strategy to deal with that? What indication, you know, how much does it, how much of an impact would that have? And what, what would we do about it? Because the houses will still be there, but what will happen to um, the people living there and so on? Um, and then on planning, I was a bit, concerned to hear your comments about the planning. Um, first of all, I've got a very specific point, which is there is currently a planning application or a, a request for a um, later development, I'm not quite sure what the right term is, for a 74 bed former care home, old people's care home in my ward, which has been turned into a mix of it certainly includes exempt and what they've they've argued in the planning application with legal opinion that because it was a care home before and they're providing care they don't need planning approval now i know that the opinion of the planning enforcement officers who've been trying to stop them operating is that that is not correct but that has gone to legal services and I just want to be assured that legal services will defend the council's position on that vigorously, because if that if that principle is lost, then across the city, any air home that shuts could be turned into exempt accommodation and there's nothing that we could do about it. So it's a really important both for me as a ward council in that location, but also as a point of principle across the city as a whole. Yeah, 74. Um, and 
Ben, I just wanted to unpick your comments about the broader planning point. To me, the critical issue is can a road um, that already has a high number of H license HMOs and exempt properties, um, will we be able to enforce our 10% rule um, when someone comes along and says, I'm going to open ex an exempt uh, uh, property in, in, in that road? Um, uh, that's the litmus test for me of, of what this plan, of what planning powers we get as a result of it. And is your view that what's going through Parliament at the moment will enable us to do that and to actually reject people that take you over the 10% or the other regulations around the, the HMO rules that this council's proposed? Thank you. Yeah, I'm going back on that. In terms of the, the, the statistics and stuff, I will make sure we get that in terms of you know what the volume of coverage is that those are currently going through the accreditation. So I'll send that out. Uh, and also, you all talked about the top 10 in terms of where in the project. There's probably five providers that, that are the, the key five that make up the vast number of provision in the city. So probably a bit more for you on, on what that actually, what those top five cover. And those are the ones that we're doing the deep dive work with the regulator on. Um, uh, but they make up pretty much the vast majority of provisions, obviously using a number of managing agents beneath them to actually do the day-to-day -day management, which is where the risk is because of the control they have over that. Um, you, you're obviously right to flag that with the increased oversight, with the, with the bill coming in, there's a greater risk that providers will, will look to walk away. Um, so we developed, as going back to the initial pilot, um, an exit protocol. We actually commissioned a piece of work. Since that, again, some principles about how we work with the regulator, with the providers, um, when some of these estimates, we, we've used that for a little, I won't name the organisations, there's two or three large providers that had exited since we started the pilot. Um, and Touch wood, there was no major fallout from that because of the close working we had, but you are reliant on the provider playing ball on that. Um, uh, but those are the sort of, you know, this is us trying to work with the sector. And a lot of them understand, you know, you talk to them about where our key pressure points are in terms of provision. We've got a temporary accommodation strategy um, going through camp at the moment. And we, you know, we, we, we've clearly got a, a high demand for family housing both from a temporary accommodation, but also secure move on. And a lot we've identified conversely that we've got too many exempt. So we're trying to work with providers about, is there any incentives and different models we can do to look to reconvert into some more suitable accommodation? Um, it is a risk, but we've got, we've got an agreed protocol in place about how you should manage that. Um, on the planning class issue, I mean, I'll take, I'll take back the issue about the specific case on the 74 and just get some assurance that um, that we've got um, planning and legal aligned on that. In terms of what's been proposed in the new bill, um, the option for the new planning class, my understanding is what, what that will do is allow us to, the same principles that we've adopted for Article 4 for HMOs, we can adopt for exempt. At the moment, we can't include the, the proliferation of HMOs and exempts to refuse an exempt application on the grounds of their existing Article 4, 10% within a certain area. What we can do at the moment, though, what legal have managed to do is include the exempt numbers in decisions around HMOs. So we just want to get it all in one place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we just want to get it all in one place because to, to all intents and purposes, the same type of, you know, problems and issues associated with that property. Um, can we just bring members' attention to the clock? I need to get this item through by uh, 11.30. Um, I'll try and be quick. Um, it's interesting to see under um, the, the recommendation three uh, and the quality standards charter that I can't see um, Reliance Social Housing anywhere there. I don't know whether they're one of the providers who are under review. What, what I'd be interested in knowing is providers that are under uh, review, regulatory review or judgment, are, are they still able to, uh, you know, uh, open more um, uh, um, prop, uh, properties or housing? Are they, are they still able to operate? Uh, and the other question is, uh, and I'd just like to declare that I work for the DWP, um, is I know from my experience there, what a lot of providers are doing is 
people who are in supported exempt accommodation, they, they, they're being told that they can't be as part of their contract or, or whatever, that they can't work more than 16 hours. Uh, so which essentially is trapping people in, in poverty. So um, I don't know if there's anything that we can around that uh, because it's, it's an absolute nightmare because you've got people who want to work, they want to get out of that awful situation that they find themselves in, but essentially they... I think I have a little problem here. Um, I, I think that you have a, a, on this particular matter, because of DWP's in, involvement, you have a, um, a registrable interest. Um, because we are discussing matters with which DWP are themselves engaged. Um, so I, I think I, I, this is wrong in my view, right? Uh, but I, I think it would be safe if, in fact, you didn't proceed with this. Um, you've got a register for interest, and the only way we could proceed with it is if you got dispensation, and that you don't have. And uh, until I get this properly cleared up, it would be better if we uh, assume that you, you've got this register register for interest uh, had to ask you to leave the meeting as did Alex that's fine I, I, I'll leave the meeting it's just I, I was part of the initial inquiry and I was allowed to take uh, uh, we now inquiry. have this paragraph which has been added to declarations of interest which I am trying to contest but I'm having much success sorry Sima um, I'm trying to be safe here rather than sorry uh, I think make you with the next one. Okay, thanks, Chair. Just four really fairly brief, brief questions. First one is in terms of the rights. There's about a couple of persons in my ward who claim that they've been absolutely targeted and in situations where they feel their charge of their rights have been bruised on this. What sort of reflect that they actually have? What sort of recourse would they Obviously, once they've left. What sort of recourse would be taken against that particular landlord? Is that sort of, that's the first one. And the second one is in terms of, I've got a couple of local residents, forums got set up in my ward. What's their protocol for getting in touch with the city-wide group directly, as opposed to coming through me, which I would want them to be as independent from me as I can do. And they say when they contact in the website, et cetera, they're finding that actually difficult. And then the third one is about, local coordination groups, when are they going to be more coming online and actually be operational in the areas? And then the fourth one was a sort of follow on to chairs perception in terms of the number, numbers actually matter, what about in the ward? It's a perception issue. We've got these number of HMOs who have sent accommodation in the area, they're causing the these problems. We understand or well, take on board what you're saying about numbers and what your teams are actually doing, doing to get on top of the problem, but we don't feel that it's a message issue. Mm. So those are the four points. Okay. Come, just come back to say, yeah, I'm, 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 if somebody's adopted the Charter of Rights, the landlord's adopted the Charter of Rights, you know, going through the accreditation process, well, I'm yeah. going to point out to you. If they're going through the accreditation process, part of that it includes the need to adopt the charter of rights and adhere to it. So if there are instances where um, they are going against that charter of rights and doing things that they shouldn't be doing, i.e. if they're evicting people because of, 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 um, um, of issues, then we because the, the, the accreditation is an ongoing thing, so there'll be an ongoing review. So we just need to get evidence of that. So again, I suppose feed it into the team and we can include it in the inspection work to see what's happened, you know, what's happened there. In terms of the local groups, I mean, there's nothing to stop local groups um, approaching us now to work closely with them. We've got the city group and if there's representation that's missing from your area, um, I can make the contact with the chair of that group. This is very much led by the residents um, rather. So I can put you in touch with the chair that's fine yeah 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 that's fine thank you um uh what's sorry what's your fourth question about the numbers it was a question when you to follow on from my question really guy it was a follow to to, to Albert's question it's more of a perception issue yeah so i think in my world i think you can talk to members of the residents about numbers and the city is doing this 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 and this yeah. 
it's almost swatted away yeah. because the reality is an outer road we've got x numbers of properties that are causing this so it's almost as though it's a question of how the city sort of regenerates its message yeah. to, to move away certain possibly just a numerical one in yeah. terms of these are the numbers but we understand the situation you feel yourselves in this is what our strategy is and if i can just uh, add a, a sort of comment to put some um, color if you like to that uh, comment through question residents don't see this as a either an uh, an hmo or as a I see it as a problem which the city council should just sort um, and so um one of the biggest issues is around waste management um, and uh, uh, waste being left out in an unacceptable way by occupants of HMOs and, and uh, exempt accommodation. As far as the residents are concerned, waste management should certainly sort it. Um, it's not an HMO issue, it's not an exempt accommodation, it's an issue which should be supported and should be sorted. Um, and you know, this is the problem for us, uh, for members, in areas where you've got high levels of HMO and exempt accommodation. They don't see it in terms of an HMO or an exempt accommodation problem. Thank you, Chair. And then the highest web benefit of this game, you know, working with local residents at a, a neighbourhood level to try and, well, I understand the range of those issues, and then it seems to work with the neighbourhood about putting together all the elements of council, inflation, housing, PRS, etc. Well, Wendy so, Griffiths is seeing that as a perhaps a pilot for other parts of the city. Uh, I followed that up with Wendy just to try and start looking at identifying where those where we've got high levels of cross council complaints in specific areas. I cleared things up. Everybody, we can bring that for Alex and Simon back in. Thank you very much, Guy and Pam. Um, I'm expecting the leader of the council at half past, which is in about a minute's time. <laughs> and Amelia had a, 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 an email just to uh, ask whether there were any, um, any delays or whatever she should do. We don't need it now, do we? Do, uh, I can see your faces on the screen, Amelia. Uh, Guy, is that Guy's <laughs> face? <laughs> um, the leader was coming at eleven thirty, wasn't he? Yeah. We'll, we'll just take the screen. Take well, we don't need the screen, do we? No, no, no. Sorry, just the sound. I can use the sound for the next few minutes until the leader arrives. It's the live stream. Okay. Okay. Time. Sorry. Yep. Taking these cameras up for the new.
If I could uh, just deal with item eight whilst we're waiting for the leader, that's the scrutiny work program uh, that's set out um, in uh, two parts, really, on coordinating ONS. I would simply say that um, we are working to bring a report back at the April meeting on homes for Ukraine. Um, the update I've got on customer services is a simply that I'm working with um, uh, Wendy Griffiths to try and move that agenda forward. She's got some slight delays that she's having to introduce because of one or two things, but I'm hoping uh, that at least I can have a fuller um, verbal on how we're to proceed on that uh, at the April meeting. Other than that, there's nothing I've got to say about scrutiny, uh, about coordinating in terms of future work programme. Moving on to the others, um, then uh, I'll just take them in the order um, very quickly. Um, so we've dealt with coordinating. Uh, then we move on to, um, in the order, it's Commonwealth Games, Culture and Physical Activity. Jack, you've got council meeting up. Got the council meeting coming up for the inquiry. That's in April, and things are moving quite well. Um, I've had a meeting with the um, relevant executive members to um, find out some of the recommendations. Um, we have uh, disagreed with the executive on some of those recommendation uh, changes. Um, and. Uh, but uh, as a scrutiny committee, of course, you will put forward the recommendations that you want to put forward. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. We've, we've agreed with some of the recommend, uh, yeah. amendments that they've suggested and disagreed with others. Okay. Uh, Ian's arrived, but I'll, I'll finish this item off, Ian. It should be a matter of a minute or two. Um, economy, skills, and overview and scrutiny. Uh, Simo, you've also got the April meeting coming up. Yeah, so so I and Part B is is uh, is coming to the April meeting. Um, uh, we've we've had um, a commentary back from the executive, which is pretty much accepting uh, you know a lot, uh, all the recommendations. Uh, so it's been really good, and we've um, had had some really uh, positive um, task and finish work sort of gone into this inquiry. And I want to thank uh, the scrutiny officers uh, for. Uh, and uh, members of the committee for you know committing so much time to this because we, we put in a lot of extra time to get this ready for uh, for April. Uh, education, children's social care, Kerry. Yeah, we've got a meeting uh, in April. Um, the Birmingham Safeguarding Partnership won't be coming to that meeting because their their report's not ready, so they've asked to come to the May meeting. So we'll be hearing from the Children's Trust with a update on the Ofsted report and around the Children and Young uh, Families Directorate Improvement Plan. Thanks, Gary. Health and social care. Yeah, this is mm -hmm. on that point, we have some interest in Ofsted. Will that be going to your week? Oh, sorry, Alex, say again. So the Children Trust have had their Ofsted Directorate. Do you know the report we're going to? They're coming to our scrutiny to give us a, an update report, and I'm assuming that it would include information around the Ofsted report. Nick. Thank you, Chair. Uh, inquiry that might be in the June, we've got the remitting of April for the inquiry to go to the report of council in July. And we're, we're really positive in terms of the work we're actually doing. And the second point would be ICB UHB report. Hopefully, we'll be going to joint loss sometime in May. Okay. Housing and neighbourhoods, we've had apologies from Mohamed Idris, so I'm just going to leave that one. Resources overview and scrutiny committee, we don't have uh, uh, Ahmed with us. Um, and sustainability and transport overview and scrutiny committee, Shannon Lal has also given his apologies. Are there any issues on any of those three that any member wants us to address? No. Okay, and what I've got there is also uh, the last item, which is the terms of reference for the Homes for Ukraine Task and Finish Group. Um, and we simply, in terms of the recommendations, uh, we've got to agree the program for coordinating, uh, review uh, the work programs for the other committees. Uh, that we've all done. Uh, note the update on the scrutiny inquiries that we've done and note and agree the terms of reference for the Homes for Ukraine uh, task and finish group. Can we agree those? 
Thank you very much. And that completes that item. Thank you, Ian. Whilst you're walking along the corridor, I thought I'd clear off another item of business. Okay. Uh, right. We've got uh, um, we've got the final cabinet member, if you like, uh, because there's four in total who report into overview and scrutiny coordinating, um, and we've got managed to get Ian here, um, although we've tried previously, but diaries have not been uh, able to be scheduled. Um, thank you very much, Ian, and I leave it to you to introduce whatever it is you want to say. Thank you. Um, I've circulated um, a report, in actual fact, setting out um, a number of um, current issues that uh, I'm dealing with. So the, it deals with the Westminster Command Authority and other policy and the partnerships that we are involved with. So just on the Westminster Command Authority, you will have heard in the budget uh, of this week that um, what was originally entitled the Trailblazer Devolution Deal for both the West Midlands and for uh, Greater Manchester was announced in the budget. I would myself, given what was announced, describe it as trailblazing. I think it's a start. Um, it's a little bit disappointing that the uh, the government have failed to um, live up to the uh, vision and the aspiration that we have for the people uh, of Birmingham. But uh, I do think it's a start. What we now need is for the government to build upon that start. We need to see more powers and, uh, and budgets being devolved out of Whitehall to uh, more local um, control. But two things I would flag up from the deal that was announced uh, within the budget are, first of all, the uh, levelling up zones that were announced. So East Birmingham and North Southern Hull is now likely to become the subject of a levelling up zone. And in that levelling up zone, we will have secured um, business rate growth retention for 25 years. So this will operate very, very similar to the enterprise zone in the city centre. And we've seen what the enterprise zone in the city centre has achieved. And this should now uh, allow us to invest in infrastructure throughout uh, East Birmingham, which uh, will lead to um, similar, perhaps not quite on the scale of the city centre, but similar uh, development, building homes, creating jobs that are much needed in East Birmingham. It's a population of a quarter of a million, so it's on a par with um, a city the size of uh, Derby and it has some of the most deprived wards in the country within it. Uh, so there is a need and now an opportunity to really transform that part of East Birmingham uh, moving into North Sully Hall. You're probably aware that there is, there are or have been plans in place for a while now for a uh, metro extension, the beginnings of which we're seeing being developed out in Digbeth, but for that extension to continue out through East Birmingham all the way out to the airport and the high-speed rail station that will, um, will be built out uh, near to the airport. And I'll come back to that a little bit uh, later on because uh, the devolution deal may have given us um, uh, an another option uh, around that. But the second thing I want to flag up um, is um, business rate retention for local authorities because we have had uh, an agreement with government for a number of years now whereby we secure 100% uh, business rate retention for Birmingham City Council. It's worth several tens of millions of pounds within the council's budget. Uh, that has been renewed on an annual basis over recent years. And uh, Secretary of State uh, had indicated that he'd like it reduced to 75%, which would have cost us £13 million pounds in this year's uh, budget. So uh, I'm pleased that in the devolution deal, we have secured uh, the retention of business rates for 10 years or until there is a national reset of business rates, which the government have been saying they, they are going to do for some time now. Um, but given where we're at, I think we may well now see it. Uh, the council retaining 100% business rates for possibly that full 10-year uh, period. The other thing that's in um, the uh, the Devo deal is um, reference to uh, very light rail, and uh, we have secured some funding from DFT uh, for this. Very light rail is a concept that's being developed out in Coventry, so it's a form of metro, but it doesn't require the uh, the scale of works that uh, the metro line that we've seen constructed in the centre of Birmingham requires. So the metro lines in in, uh, in Birmingham require all of the piping and wires underneath the rail to be moved to the side of the road. That's what takes up uh, an enormous amount of time in constructing uh, the metro, uh, and then the rails are, are laid. With very light rail, you don't need to do that element of it. And there are some tests uh, being carried out at the moment to see if. Um, a metro could actually operate on a very light rail infrastructure. 
Um, if all of these things prove uh, possible, that may well be a cheaper and better value for money solution to this line that's going to connect up the centre of Birmingham out to the airport and the uh, HS2 station that's uh, out near the airport. Um, the other thing I want to flag up um, is the uh, Commonwealth Games underspend. Um, and I've lost the page. So the Commonwealth Games underspend, which uh, the government share uh, of that has gone to uh, the combined uh, authority to uh, manage. Uh, we have uh, received back our 25% uh, of that underspend and the City Council it, we're now need to decide how it's going to spend that money. Uh, but with uh, respect to the the, uh, the 75 percent of the government's uh, share of that money that's gone to the combined authority, there is a paper tabled at today's combined authority board meeting. They're probably considering it while we speak that sets out how that money is now going to be allocated to different pillars and therefore spent. And the two things I want to flag up are, first of all, that the European Athletics Championships, which we have secured the rights to host in 2026, there is two sums of money that will relate to that event within uh, the paper that's gone to the CA board this morning. Uh, one uh, is a sum of 10.7 million, and the other one's listed as uh, European Athletics Championships Grassroots Sport Fund for 3 million. So we will be securing some 13.7 million pounds towards the cost of hosting that event from that Commonwealth Games underspend. We're still working on what the uh, the balance figure will be to deliver the event, but we should uh, we should know what that's going to be in due course. And then we'll bring forward uh, proposals for how that gap uh, is going to be funded. Uh, and the other thing I uh, wanted to flag up was that um, there is a line within the CA report about further major events for the West Midlands, a sum of £6 million set aside for this. This sum of money is going to be administered by the West Midlands Growth Company. Uh, and I've already had some discussions with the growth company uh, about an event that the city may be hosting next year. We're in talks about hosting it. It's called Sport Accord. It is the largest sports conference in the world. It brings together all of the world governing bodies of sports into one location. Uh, and we are in discussions about bringing that to Birmingham next year. And as I've just said, I'm in discussion with the growth company about the funding for that being achieved out of that six million has been set aside. The other things in, uh, in the report that I've, uh, I've circulated, uh, there's a section on core cities and what we are doing with core cities. In particular, that flags up the uh, UK Urban Futures Commission, um, which we are working uh, in core cities on. And there is a, a UK Urban Futures uh, conference coming up in uh, summer. We're also involved in a project uh, around uh, the Commission for Climate Investment, and that involves not just core cities, but also key cities, uh, London councils and the county councils network. So that's bringing in most of, uh, of local government on that. Some international work that is uh, ongoing. And then the final thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention in the report, so I assume you've all read it, uh, will be the Leveling Up Birmingham All Party Parliamentary Group that we uh, set up. It was constituted in May of last year. Its purpose is to showcase and advocate for prosperity and opportunity for all, which is Birmingham's levelling up strategy. Uh, and it puts the city at the forefront of uh, the levelling up uh, policy uh, agenda. The APPG started off co-chaired by uh, Preet Gill MP and Andrew Mitchell MP. Uh, Andrew, on his promotion to uh, the government, uh, actually stepped back. So Gary Sandbrook is now the other co-chair of this. Uh, we've engaged a, an organisation called Kratos, who are the secretariat for the APPG, because we're not permitted to do that ourselves. We have to have a, a, a different body uh, that does it. It was launched in June of last year, uh, and it held its first meeting in October of last year. And the next business meeting will take place uh, this coming May, and it will be a panel discussion and we'll be discussing the challenges and opportunities for Birmingham businesses and the impact of the current cost of living crisis, as well as uh, our future city plan. And our future city plan, that document, you all will have had sight of it, or the opportunity to have sight of it, is going to be formally launched at UK Reef this coming May, and I expect it to, um, to attract quite a bit of national attention.
I'll leave it there, uh, Albert and Bill. I'm happy to take any questions on either this paper or anything else in respect of my portfolio. Thank you very much, Ian. I already got indications from some of the members that, that they had questions. Just one little point for me, that potential conference you spoke about, would that be ICC or an EC? It'll be ICC. Ewan? Thank you very much, Albert. Um, really, it was the deeper de de devolution deal that I was going to talk about. I, I can understand why we very much me about it. Um, I, think, <laughs> I, th I think that really it's a bit of a, more of a step forward than, you know, you know, it, it's very difficult. But I think Adam Street's tried to be quite cross-party with it. I think he's got all the, he's got all the, all the leaders involved yourself. I think Richard was even on the negotiating team. He's, he's gone at it from a regional focused area to get best with region, not so much on a party and political one. And I, I think it is a really good deal. It's, it's not the deal that, that you want, obviously, because you always shoot for the stars. And if you don't get it, you get the moon, you can set that. Um, but, you know, you've got 500 million um, uh, housing deal to be building on brownfield sites here. As you say, you've got the potential, the retention of business rates for 10 years, which I don't think all councils have that. So um, I think it's a massive extension for them. You've got your levelling up build, business zones, which I think is based on 25 years of <laughs> business rates. You've got the same level, the area now is treated about correct, the same level as a department in Whitehall, where before we've had to go back, and we've always had to try and justify what we needed as an area and always had to sell it to the government first. Now we're actually like a, a department, so there is an upgrade uh, there. There's some money, four million pounds for, for the digital, in, in, digital inclusion priority. I mean, that's a, that's a um, priority of this council, something that we've all said about to making sure that people are left behind digitally. So there's four million pounds uh, there for that. And, you know, it's like all these things, we also want more money for these things. But, you know, there's an actual council requirement being addressed there. Devolution of bus services. Uh, again, you know, we've been looking forward to more control of the bus services. That's there. There's a thing there on green energy. So there's not everything that you want in this stand, but I was, you know, I think you probably could give it a more you could be more excited about it. You might say that it's not everything that you need, but I, I think that you probably could be a bit more reckless. You could reciprocate the states more like that and just say, you know, it's a better deal than sort of you probably were, were thinking you were going to get at the end of the day. It's a decent deal. It, it ticks a lot in your boxes, and I think it's a great step forward moving forward and it gives you something to negotiate around in the future. So, I mean, that, that's my view on it. You can, you'll probably disagree, actually. And there was bound to be another political interpretation, but there we are. Do you want to comment? Yes, uh, allow me to be prodded into being more optimistic then. Um, <laughs> as I've already said, I think the, uh, the levelling up zones are the significant thing that was announced. And it was actually Birmingham City Council who pushed uh, really hard to get those uh, included uh, in, in this particular deal. So uh, it, it is to the credit of staff here at BCC that that is in the deal. Just to be clear though, uh, you quoted a figure of 500 million on uh, on housing. It's 200 of that 500 is already committed to Homes England money. And that's the only element of it at the moment that is actually uh, guaranteed. Business rate retention did apply to all seven of the West Midlands Met. So it's a, it's a, it's a positive outcome for all seven of the metropolitan authorities. We've not achieved the devolution of bus services. What we've achieved is the devolution of bus service operators grant. So we'll have some control now over uh, how that gets passported across uh, to the operators and give us a lever uh, to have more of a say in uh, how they operate services and which services, which routes uh, they actually uh, operate on. So yeah, it, it's, it's definitely a deal that we are going to sign up to. My point is, if you start off saying we're going to have a trailblazing deal, you you know, you do raise expectations, and this has fallen a little short of being trailblazing, in my view. I, I can accept it is a deal worth having, and it's definitely a deal that we need to build on. We'll agree on the last bit. Okay, right. I'm going to move it on. Uh, Roger. Yeah, so um, could I add a bit more um, your thoughts on the um, metro? stroke light rail very light rail situation because you know in all the looking more broadly all the discussion about you know, things like low traffic neighborhoods and so on the real point is we've got to get people off cars onto public transport and looking at it now the sort of vast investment in um the metro 
so far at, at, a, at huge cost because of the reasons you've given about having to basically completely rebuild the roads, which it runs. All it's done so far is link up parts of the city centre. We haven't yet got to the point where it's serving, you know, bringing people in and out of the city centre. Um, and, you know, frustratingly, had the, 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 the five ways um, terminal stopped just short of the point where if it had gone another two or three stops, it would be starting to bring people in and out of, um, out of the, the west side of the city. Um, and I guess, I, you know, I had perhaps hoped that, what the, that, that that vast cost was down to the fact that we were doing city centre streets. And then once you got to doing more suburban streets, then the cost of shifting stuff out of the way you know, wouldn't be so bad. But that just doesn't seem to be the case if you look at the costs of going through East Birmingham. Um, so what, where, what is the vision then? If we're saying, well, very light rail might be the answer, are we looking at, you know, in the long term, creating a network of very light rail on the sort of routes that Metro might have initially been envisioned to go, so through East Birmingham, out on the Hackley Road, and then sort of linking up in some way with with the metro so can the light rail trains run on the metro tracks um what how how are we going to develop if, if, if very light rail is going to be the answer to this problem because we don't seem to have them seems unlikely we're going to get the money um how is that actually going to work and would it actually are the costs significantly enough lower that it actually allows us to start looking at uh, more of a network than just filling in the bits that we had originally hoped to, to do um, with the metro itself. Uh, the vision is very much still to create a, uh, a network of metro in one form or another, uh, and the vision remains to connect the city centre, the HS2 station, city centre, to the HS2 interchange station out at Birmingham Airport. That very much remains uh, the vision. The questions you're asking about very light rail have yet to be answered because it, it, it is a concept that's currently being tested. So it's been developed in commentary. Uh, the testing is now being carried out in Wolverhampton, I think it is. Um, and they're, they're testing out the concept. So the cost questions that you've raised, they're testing them out. And they're also testing out whether you could have a, a metro vehicle run on a very light rail infrastructure. Uh, because the very light rail um, units are a lot smaller than, uh, than, than the current metro units. But to, to give you some idea of, of where we are with uh, all of this, the East Birmingham, that extension out to the interchange station, is going to cost in excess of a billion pounds to achieve. So, you know, we're talking very, very big numbers here. If we can reduce those costs significantly through light rail, it may prove to be a more cost-effective uh, solution. The Wensbury briley Hill extension that um, wasn't funded, even though it was in the programme for the minor project. In the Devo deal, £60 million has been uh, allocated towards that. The cost of the Briley and extension is somewhere between 165 and 200. So it doesn't uh, achieve the full uh, cost of the scheme. But there is a pledge that in round two of the CRSTS programme, which is the capital programme, devolve capital budget for transport uh, investments in the West Midlands and elsewhere. Uh, we're promised that balance, the balance of that number will come in that second round of CRSTS funding. Thanks, Ian. I have uh, forgotten, Roger, but uh, actually in 2015, there was an agreement with George Osborne uh, to fund uh, the Metro all the way out uh, to uh, the NEC. And with Cameron and Osborne's departure, uh, Treasury um, uh, uh, rode back uh, on that uh, understanding, that agreement. Uh, Jack. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd really welcome um, any kind of devolution of powers, responsibility, and and, and budget responsibility, and um, to the region. But I do worry that um, with increased levels of devolution um, in the region, that um, we 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 have a gap where accountability and um, scrutiny becomes um, far greater to um, achieve. And I I don't know what the what the answer is, but I think that there needs to be some level of of lobbying the government to make sure that there is actually an increased level of scrutiny within the WMCA, whether that is um, increasing the amount of um, representations from each local authority in the region or um, going the style of um, 
the London Assembly um, if increased evolution does happen. I don't know the specific answer and I don't necessarily have uh, a political opinion or preference for either of them at this point, um, but I do think that needs to be explored. Um, if we are to fully enable ourselves to scrutinise the WMCA, and we know that scrutiny is supposed to add value um, to WMCA decisions. Yes, uh, and in actual fact, uh, the government are very much on that agenda as well, but the government see it very much through their lens. So as a part of the deal, uh, what the government are requiring is that uh, both the mayor and uh, other portfolio leads within the CA will be expected to present to parliamentary select committees on what we're up to. So this is always devolution and budgets with strings attached. Um, and that there's going to have to be a quarterly engagement with the West Midlands MPs so I think that will be uh, an interesting uh, meeting once uh, once a quarter. Um, MPs are elected to legislate. They're uh, going to be asking us questions about service delivery and budgets. So it'll be an interesting meeting. And on top of those uh, two proposals, there's also a requirement for uh, the mayor and portfolio holders to report to scrutiny committees at West Middle Metropolitan Authorities. More work, I guess. Uh, very joined up agenda is the problem. Anybody else? Questions, comments? No? Okay, thank you very much, Ian. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add. No, uh, I don't think so. Just thank you very much. Thanks indeed. Okay, we've just got a couple of them, very minor matters, I think, to deal with um, before closing the meeting. Um, uh, requests for call-in, etc. I've no notifications of anything there. That was item nine. Item ten, other urgent business. Any other urgent business? No. Date and time of the next meeting, that's listed as 14th of April at 10 a.m. Okay. And authority to chair an officer for normal, uh, usual resolution. Agree that? Agreed. Thank you very much. And I can close the meeting at three minutes to 12 albeit we started at 10.30 and not 10 o'clock. Well done.